Social security cards can be viewed as the mark of the beast, right? Driver's license could be viewed as the mark of the beast in a way. So it's just, it's just comical when that's just thrown out there so flippantly as if it's just this, it only applies to technology in the future, but it can't apply to what you have today. It's just very interesting. That's right. And in fact, I mean, it has been applied to things in the past. We've just forgotten. Right. They've right. forgotten. The fundamentalists have forgotten. And it's been applied to things, to technologies that existed 2000 years ago. And, and the fundamentalists today have just forgotten. So it, it's kind of a, boogie, a, a boogeyman. But, um, but what do we do about that? Do we just give up on them? And my answer to that is no. But we also don't have to take a, we, don't, we aren't, there, there is, there are more options than simply the in your face, you have to become a transhumanist or you're worthless, which some transhumanists seem to take up. And of course, they're not, they're not effective. It's, it's as silly as the religious fundamentalists. Some transhumanists also just shrug their shoulders and they don't care. Um, which is probably less problematic than being an ass like the other transhumanists, but still it's not a solution. There are, but the other alternatives would be, well, let's just help them. Let's decentralize power. Let's make them healthier and smarter and happier through technological means that they are comfortable with, whatever those might be today and whatever they might be tomorrow gradually, but we don't have to shove all of it on them at once. Let's help them in their own way. And I trust that in the same way that it's now normal to use cell phones, and that probably would have freaked out people a hundred years ago who would have called it witchcraft, let alone a thousand years ago. Can you even imagine? You, you would have been burnt at the stake a thousand years ago if you whipped out your iPhone. Um, but over time that changed and now it's totally normal. All the, all the, uh, religious fundamentalists in the United States use, not all, but most of them use cell phones and they're cool with that. Oh, well, they might, they'll probably say something about 5g infesting their brain or something, but they'll keep using their, their cell phones. Most of them. It's just not a serious criticism anymore. Right. Um, and, and I think that a lot of other technologies will become that way gradually over time. So I think it behooves us as, as transhumanists to be practical about this. We're transhumanists. We advocate a transhumanist approach um, that, you know, technology can be a good thing if we use it ethically. And let's remember the word ethically, right? Ethically involves all kinds of things. That means that we need to use technology in the right ways to help each other. But we also need to remember that ethics involve things like consent, and that if we're trying to impose things on other people, we're no longer behaving ethically. And so we have to persuade them to, cons to consent. We have to persuade them to be interested. And if they're not interested in one thing, well then let's drop it. Why force something on somebody that does doesn't want it? We need to make space for each other. And that effort is also part of decentralizing power. So as we decentralize power, we behave more ethically, we let people use what's consistent with their desires and their values to the extent that they're not oppressing other people. And I think that what we'll see is that people will gradually at their comfort level change and embrace different things over time. Now, will there be different rates of change? Yeah, there probably will. And I don't think that we'll ever in billions of years live in a perfectly you know, leveled out society universally. I just don't think that will ever exist. Part of why I don't think that will exist is because I don't think it exists today. I, I trust that super intelligent beings exist today and that, and that super intelligence has created the world that we live in. And I'm confident that we're not their equals. So if that's the case today, it will probably be the case tomorrow. But that also kind of speaks to the decentralization of power. Something about the way that that superintelligence is structured, assuming that my trust is correct, that it currently exists, allows for our coexistence. Mm -hmm. Something about it allows for our coexistence. And I, and I think the best explanation for that is that their power is probably, probably decentralized. 
and that the risks of that decentralization are such that it promotes cooperation among them to such an extent that the compassion bleeds out into the way that they treat us. And, and, and we see that among humans already. Um, the animal rights movement did not exist 200 years ago. Sorry, folks, didn't exist. Why does it exist today? Well, because humans have become far more cooperative today than we were 200 years ago. And that's bleeding out beyond humanity already. We're trying to seek ways of, of lessening suffering around, among non-humans. And I think that we'll continue to see that happen as our own interest in cooperation and even necessity toward cooperation increases. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you there. The only thing that I would um, question you further on is uh, to, to further define what you mean by decentralized power, because some people can take that as socialism, right? Because you're just dispersing all the power amongst the people. And we've seen how that works. It doesn't work too well. And naturally in nature, we see hierarchies form everywhere. So there, there's not gonna be complete decentralization. So, so what exactly do you mean when, when you're talking about this decentralization of power? Yeah, great question. So historically, the, the, the kind of decentralization of power to which I aspire would not have been, nor is it today, technologically possible. So when we look historically, I, I call this libertopia. There's the right, right-wing right libertarians who want to decentralize power from their perspective. They want to live in a libertarian world, a world where people are left alone to do what they want to as long as they're not oppressing each other. But where, what have we seen happens in that? Well, it really just creates power vacuums. Mm -hmm. And where there's a power vacuum, somebody will get a whole bunch of guns together, form a hierarchy, and pretty quick you have a dictatorship that forms. And really the best case study for Libertopia is Africa, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of people who, you know, there's not, there weren't, there weren't some strong central governments to, you know, no Leviathan to prevent it. So somebody stepped in and took the power and now they've got the guns and there's no decentralized power. There's no Libertopia, there's just the dictator. Mexico is also a good example of that, too, with the cartels rivaling the government. There you go. So um, that's an example on the on the right side, on the on the left side. Um, from an ideological perspective, I identify as a, as a left libertarian or a libertarian socialist. And that's it's important to distinguish that from an authoritarian socialist. Most people on the left today, um, most mainstream people on the left today lean authoritarian. And what I mean by that is they lean towards this idea that government can solve our problems for us, centralized government can and should solve problems for us. The, the <clears throat> excuse me, the kind of the, the boogeyman in, in that line of thinking, of course, is communism mm -hmm. and people on the right will accuse the left of being communists. And what they mean by that is that people on the left want to become authoritarian socialists and they want to control everything in a, in a centralized way, centralized planning, centralized control of everything to, to make the world better according to their centralized set of values. And of course, the concern on the right, which concern I deeply share in this case, is that that ends up creating things like what we've seen historically, the USSR and other abuses of that authority. And it doesn't achieve the communitarian ideals that it sets out to achieve um, because it's so inefficient and because it lends itself to abuse of power. So that centralized authority ends up becoming corrupted and bad things happen. So how do you balance this problem where if you go to libertarian, you can't get anything worthwhile done. It creates power vacuums and dictatorships arise. Or if you go too authoritarian, then the power is abused and you don't achieve those beautiful communitarian ideals. So what's a, what's a libertarian socialist like me supposed to do? Where I want to be both a libertarian and I have these communitarian ideals, I want to help each other. And that's where I think um, we need to look for new forms of technology and new forms of governance that haven't existed before. 
Um, and I've mentioned already, I think blockchain may be the beginnings of enabling that. But the idea is that we need formal decentralization, not informal decentralization. Libertopia and power vacuums and dictatorships are the consequence of informal decentralization. We need formal decentralization, empowered decentralization. And I don't know exactly what that means. There's a lot of questions to answer and a lot of work to do. But I do believe that we're starting to see the beginnings of it in the work that we're doing in peer-to-peer -peer information technologies, most well exemplified today by all of the blockchain technologies, decentralized finance.